Good morning. Welcome to worship at Cardiff Canton on our Good Friday. We're going to start by singing a song by Graham Kendrick, From Heaven You Came, Helpless Babe. It's, it's a song really that sums up the whole of the life of Christ, from heaven to glorification, uh, living on earth, dying for our sins, rising again. So it kind of reminds us of the whole Easter story and we'll stand and we'll sing all the verses through, please. From heaven you Let's close our eyes and just for a moment pause and consider the sacrifice that Christ has made for you, for me, for all people. We thank you, Father God, for the life and the sacrifice of your son. We thank you for his obedience, his love, his desire to do your will for our sakes. We thank you, Lord, for the example he set in all of his living 
the stories that we can read about Jesus in the Gospels. His wise words. But most of all, Father God, for his sacrifice for us. Something that we can't fully understand. And yet we hear testimony to, to it repeatedly in Scripture that Christ died for us. Help us, Father God, to be people who live lives of self-denial. Lives for others, for you. Help us, Lord, by our living to enthrone Jesus. And just as he served, help us also to be people who live lives of service. We pray for our fellowship, Lord, those who are suffering just now. We pray for Nick, Lord, and his family, that you'll be close to them. We pray for those, Lord, who would love to be here but can't get out. We pray for our world. All those who are suffering today perhaps feel as though they can't stop for a moment. Even if the day is special for them. Those who are in the midst of conflict in Ukraine. Those who are running from bombs and bullets in other parts of the world too. We pray, Lord, that you will give leaders wisdom and you will give them hearts that, that desire peace and love and mercy. So that your kingdom can come on earth as it is in heaven. You have made it possible through the death of Jesus. As we continue to worship you this morning, Lord, challenge us, change us, come near to us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's turn to another song. 197 in the Salvation Army songbook. Say, are you weary? Are you heavy laden? Burdened with sorrow, weighed down with care. Are you in bondage? Do you want deliverance? Come then with me. There is refuge from despair. Let's remain seated as we sing these words, please.
This morning we're going to look at uh, the story of Good Friday as John gives it to us. We have four Gospels, four uh, accounts of the Easter story. So we're going to look at John's Gospel. Before we do, I just draw your attention to Sue's lovely um, display around the cross and the items at the foot of the cross that remind us about different parts of the story. The, The towel and the bowl of water, Sue put that there to remind us of Pilate washing his hands. But the first thing that I thought of when I saw that was the night before when Jesus was with the disciples, removed his outer garment, knelt down and washed the disciples' feet. And then we have the 30 pieces of silver in the bag. We have the... um, the palm crosses, I guess, for Palm Sunday. We have the ointment um, to remind us, of course, that on Easter Sunday, women went to prepare his body for burial, but Jesus had already been anointed by um, Mary uh, uh, at the house of Mary and Lazarus. Um, uh, a few days before, before he went in on the donkey. We have some chains there to remind us of the ordeal of Jesus leading up to the crucifixion. And we have some nails as well. And the purple robe and the crown of thorns. Well, I've asked uh, three people, Caitlin, Gareth and Hilary, to read for us. I think Caitlin is going to bring us the first reading. Is that right? Verse 14 to 22 of John 19. So here's Caitlin. John 19, 14 to 22. It was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Then they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had noticed had a notice prepared and fastened onto the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the King of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. Thank you, Caitlin. Here is your king. That was what Pilate said, round about noon. By the time he had spoken those words to the crowd, gathered outside his headquarters, the soldiers had already done their best to deprive Jesus of his dignity. They had dressed him in a purple robe, purple being the colour worn by kings. They had hailed him as king of the Jews whilst hitting him and spitting at him. They had woven a crown of thorns and pressed it into his skull. I've not reflected on this before, but just as Caitlin was reading those words, I was thinking, I don't think Jesus is mentioned as king until we get to Good Friday in John's Gospel. I'm not sure about that. Lots of other things are said about Jesus. Uh, Right at the very beginning, John says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So John is right at the start um, speaking of Jesus in the highest possible terms. But I don't think King is mentioned until we get to Good Friday and we have this really ironic way of describing a king, a king with a crown 
of thorns. Here is your king. For over 500 years, the Jews had longed for another king from the line of David. King Herod Antipas was no good. He was a puppet of the Roman occupiers, not even a proper Jew, let alone a descendant of David. You don't like Herod? Well, says Pilate, here is your king. The irony is that this Jesus made a public spectacle, uh, a, a laughing stock. This Jesus really is king. And I think John's waited in his gospel to say it at this point when Jesus is being uh, crucified. A thousand years earlier, God granted the people a king as a concession because they wanted to be like all the other nations. God gave them a king, a go-between. First Saul, that was the very first king. Then David, then Solomon, then a whole succession of others. But all of them, all of them were flawed. We can read about their flaws as the, as the stories of them are given to us in the Old Testament. You won't find a single one of them where there isn't a flaw of some sort mentioned. None could really match up to the job until Jesus. Jesus, the king, had none of the trappings of worldly wealth. No palace, no belongings, except a few clothes and that seamless undergarment that the soldiers cast lots for. Jesus, the king, had no earthly armies to command or worldly weapons to wield. But Jesus was king in the best Jewish sense of the word because Jesus really was God's representative on earth. Just before his arrest, Philip pleaded with him, show us the Father. And Jesus said to Philip, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Later on, when the risen Jesus held out his scarred hands to Thomas, Thomas looked at him and saw God. Even later, Paul sums up what Christians thought about Jesus when he wrote that Jesus is the image, the icon of the invisible God. None of these ideas about Jesus were obvious before the resurrection, though. And we have the benefit of hindsight when we read all of the stories about Jesus, from his birth all the way through his life to the resurrection. We're going to sing again song 190, O Sacred Head Once Wounded, and then we'll have the next part of uh, the reading from John, which I think Gareth's got, verses 23 to 27, is that right? Yeah? Okay, so uh, we'll sing again. O sacred head once wounded, please.
Now let's listen to John chapter 19, verses 23 to 27. John 19, verses 23 to 27. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, They divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Thank you, Gareth. There, there were lots of crucifixions. That was how Rome kept control. Before the resurrection, it might have been reasonable to overlook just another Roman execution. Why single this particular one out from all of the others? Why call this day Good Friday? The resurrection of Jesus gave the writer of John's Gospel and the writers of the other Gospels the hindsight to be able to describe Jesus as the word made flesh, with God in the beginning, the light that shines in the darkness. It was all because of the resurrection that Thomas could exclaim, my Lord and my God. When the New Testament writers tell us about the crucifixion of Jesus, they do so with the benefit of hindsight from the perspective of the resurrection they know what happens next they know that this man who was crucified for claiming to represent God was vindicated when he rose from the dead they remembered all the things that he had said when he was alive and they all now made sense they looked through their scriptures and things that they had read in the Old Test in our Old Testament took on new meaning, new significance. Isaiah chapter 53, more than any other part of the Old Testament, perhaps. He was crushed for our iniquities, he was wounded for our transgressions. The, pr the punishment that brought us peace was upon him by his wounds. We are healed. It all made sense. Nobody in their wildest dreams could have expected to find, when they looked at another crucifixion, God nailed to a cross. And we have to be very careful here because the Bible doesn't explicitly say anywhere that God was nailed to a cross. But it does say that Jesus fully incarnates, fully encapsulates God for us. Jesus, the Son of God. And it does say that God loved us so much that Christ died for us. And so, whatever we make of the crucifixion, we have to recognise that the, the New Testament as one voice, although there are many writers in the New Testament, as one voice, they say that the crucifixion is a demonstration of God's love for us, a demonstration of Christ's love for us. Somehow or another, 
Christ's dying on the cross deals with our sin, deals with all those things that make us unworthy. None of us, not a single one of us, is worthy. There are all things in our lives which we think, well, I could have done better there. There are all things which make us unworthy, but Christ deals with all of our sin. Pilate had said to the people, here is your king. But we look at the cross on Good Friday and the New Testament says to us, here is your God. Here is your God. Responding to the world's sin, not with vengeance, but with love. Here is your God, faithful to the promises he had made towards his creation, suffering in himself the consequences of rebellious creatures, the perfect king standing in the gap between humankind and our holy God, the Father. We're going to sing again how deep the Father's love for us. Let's stand as we sing these words, please. Now let's listen as Hilary brings to us the third part of our Good Friday reading from John's Gospel. This is John 19, verses 28 to 37. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it to his lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now it was the day of preparation and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. 
Because the Jewish leaders didn't want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus, they found he was already dead. They did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you may also believe. These things happen so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken, and, as another scripture says, they will look on the other one they have pierced. Amen. Thank you, Hilary. Let's sing When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. So as Jesus hangs on the cross, he calls out, I am thirsty. And we're reminded of the other time in John's Gospel, also about noon, when Jesus sought a drink. As he sat by the well, he told a Samaritan woman that he was Messiah, God's anointed. Another way of saying king of the Jews I guess so it was mentioned earlier on in a roundabout sort of way Jesus said he was the source of life giving water to that Samaritan woman and John writes that she left her water jar and went straight away to tell her neighbours does John want us to make a connection between these two thirsty noontime episodes? Is he suggesting that Jesus, King of the Jews, crucified God, suffers thirst 
so that we might never thirst. Does Jesus lack water so that we might have the water of life? They gave him wine vinegar soaked in a sponge. The really cheap stuff, it was kind of an act of mercy, intended like a, a, a poor anaesthetic to dull the pain. But in John chapter 2, the bridegroom at the wedding of Cana is commended for saving the best wine until last. Jesus had turned the water into wine. On Good Friday, does Jesus, King of the Jews, drink or refuse to drink only wine vinegar so that we might feast upon all the riches of God's kingdom? Was it last Sunday or the Sunday before we thought about the, the heavenly banquet, the banquet that marks the coming kingdom of God? The drink was delivered on the end of a hyssop stalk, John says. The same plant used by priests to sprinkle the blood of sacrifices over the mercy seat, the place of atonement right at the centre of the temple. And before that, it was the plant that the, the, the Israelites who were going to escape from Egypt were told to use to sprinkle blood over their doors the night when they, they sacrificed a lamb for each household so that the angel of death would pass over. That's how they got the, the um, festival of Passover. The drink was delivered on the end of a hyssop stalk. Could it be that John wants us to recognise Jesus, King of the Jews, as the sacrifice that reconciles God and humanity? Back in John chapter 4, the Samaritans who heard the testimony of the woman at the well met Jesus for themselves and proclaimed that they had discovered the saviour of the world. When the soldier thrust the spear into his side, blood and water flowed. People have a hard time believing in resurrection and one of the ways of reasoning it away is to suppose that maybe Jesus never really died in the first place. But the gospel writer means to be very clear about the facts. Blood and water flowed and the man who saw it has given witness. He knows that he tells the truth. He gives witness so that you also can believe. When the soldier thrust the spear into his side, blood and water flowed. Jesus really did die. But the blood is also a sign. A sign that Jesus was the perfect sacrifice that put things right. The blood says, I am forgiven. And the water reminds me that even though he thirsts, Jesus is the source of abundant, everlasting life. A moment ago we sang, sorrow and love, blood and water flow mingled down. Can you decide for yourself that as desolate as such a place of execution is, you will not turn away from the cross? Can you decide for yourself to follow in the steps of Jesus Christ, King of kings, icon of God? Can you, like him, take up your cross? That was what he said before he died to his disciples. Take up your cross and follow me. Not a Roman cross but a way of sacrifice, a way of living that answers sin with love. Can you? Because the way of the cross is the way to everlasting life. It is the way to do our part to see God's kingdom come 
on earth as it is in heaven. Let's turn to our final song we will stand to sing. I heard a voice so gently calling, take up thy cross and follow me. Let's stand please. And a final prayer. Father God, we thank you that because of Christ's death, you give us everything we need to, to daily grow into your, li your likeness. And you equip us with everything we need to be people who follow in Christ's footsteps and make his kind of difference in the world. Bless us, Lord, as we seek to do that, to be Jesus' people, disciples of Jesus. And we pray, Lord, that as we do that, that you will work in our lives and that you will transform us and the world around us so that little by little, people can see your kingdom coming on earth as it is in heaven. And we pray this in the name of Jesus who lived and who died and who rose again. Amen.